on this Monday night, a day of demonstrations outside Canadian hospitals. Protests against pandemic protocols and vaccine passports. Our freedom is, um, is violated. The political pledges to protect healthcare workers and patients. The Conservatives' positive campaign descends into personal attacks. I think it's a sign of desperation. The fight for progressive voters. Courting younger Canadians. They're unsure about who they want to vote for. Their biggest concerns and the barriers they face. Plus, family tragedy. The discovery of two adults and four children in a burnt-out trailer. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Frontline healthcare workers inside Canada's hospitals have put the well-being of Canadians ahead of their own throughout the pandemic. So it seems unfathomable that hospitals are now the target of protests. But it's what's happening today right across the country. The protests coincide with British Columbia implementing a proof of vaccination certificate that's required for access to non-essential services and to attend large events. Political leaders are condemning demonstrations that block medical facilities and intimidate doctors, nurses and patients. We'll get to reaction from the campaign trail in just a moment. But first, Eric Sorensen looks at who is behind the protests and what can be done to keep hospitals from becoming battle lines. They have mounted protests outside hospitals across the country. Say no to the vaccine passport in Canada. Among the organizers, a few health workers, including a nurse who was fired after being part of an anti-lockdown rally last year. They're protesting vaccine mandates, being forced, they say, to take drugs they don't want. That's threatening, it's conjoling, it's bullying, it's tyranny. Call it whatever you like. It's wrong. Really basic human rights are being violated. They're a fraction of the population, but even small numbers could choke off access to hospitals or intimidate workers and patients. One doctor, a lone sentinel outside a Toronto hospital today, stands behind the science and vaccines that are accepted by the vast majority of Canadians. Behind us is sacred ground. This is a place where people come to get healed, where people are sick, and where professionals like myself and the nurses I work with deserve to be treated with respect and not intimidated or harassed. He's not alone. Major health organizations for nurses and doctors are calling for safe zones to allow people into and out of hospitals safely. What we really are hoping for is that um, those entryways, those exit ways are maintained, that the healthcare workers that are going in and out of hospitals are not harassed or abused, and ultimately that they can do their job uh, in the middle of a pandemic in a meaningful way. It is not the place to protest. It is wrong. All the federal leaders condemned blocking access to health centers today. These protests, this harassment of our frontline uh, nurses, doctors, is completely unacceptable. The Liberals say they'll pass legislation to make it a crime. We are protecting people, including health care workers, from those who would scream obscenities at them and spit on them on their way into work to save lives. This healthcare worker is blunt. To bring this here, to bring this kind of vitriol of where people have been working flat out um, and continue to go nonstop uh, to help people, uh, it's hard to understand the rationale. The demonstrators have targeted what for most Canadians are cherished institutions that save lives. And if the protesters themselves get sick and need help, will save their lives too. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Anti-vaccine and anti-mask protesters have followed Liberal leader Justin Trudeau since he called the election last month. And as Eric mentioned, Trudeau is now promising to crack down on demonstrations that disrupt hospitals and health centres. But is a new law necessary? Abigail Beeman is following the Liberal campaign. We need to nourish, celebrate and protect their jobs. When talking about the need to protect people from COVID, Justin Trudeau often brings up son Hadrian, too young for a vaccine. Monday, he and Sophie were by Trudeau's side in Vancouver as he announced a re-elected Liberal government would make it illegal to block access to health care sites with protests at hospitals across the country. It is not okay that across the country, hospitals are having to put up barricades today to manage the mobs coming their way. 
The promise extends to vaccine centers and abortion clinics. Tell the truth, you but it's already illegal to utter threats or assault someone, of course. So is a new law necessary? This is a mixture of political grandstanding and the ability to create another wedge issue with O'Toole. Trudeau certainly gives him the gears in the release. But it also might be time to clarify this for police and other people. Can they be charged with things already? Yes. What potentially makes a new provision necessary or beneficial, or as someone who formerly worked as a law reform lawyer, I would suggest a good idea, is that it sends a signal to the population. It's an idea politically popular enough that the NDP announced something similar last week. We want to specifically protect healthcare workers by changing the criminal code to make it an aggravating offense, an aggravating element to in any way impede or assault or any way threaten a healthcare worker. I don't know if I have an opinion yet on whether or not it's necessary, but I will say this. Um, some of the images that we saw from the previous protests are absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, and any measures that uh, help to prevent that from happening in the future are uh, absolutely a good thing. Trudeau himself was punchy with protesters who followed him to an interview at Global BC. Isn't there a hospital you should be going to bother right now? Monday's announcement is part of a broader Liberal strategy in the final week to hammer home differences on wedge issues and the party hope set up a clear choice between a re-elected Liberal government and their top opponents in a tight race, the Conservatives. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Richmond, B.C. And B.C.'s new vaccine passport system took effect today, the same day the province announced it will be mandating vaccinations for all health care workers. British Columbia's top doctor says the rule will include workers, students, physicians, residents, contractors and volunteers who work in any health care facility. The order will go into effect on October 26th. A week or so into the new school year, dangerous outbreaks of COVID-19 have already led to school closures in Prince Edward Island and Ontario. And today, New Brunswick announced all students will be required to wear masks. The goal is to keep in-person learning going as long as possible. But as Heather Urex west explains, the highly transmissible Delta variant isn't making it easy. With COVID-19 cases now at 11 schools across the province, New Brunswick is changing its back-to-school plan. Effective tomorrow, students of all ages in all schools across New Brunswick must wear a mask in school and while on school buses. In Quebec, students in 72 schools will now be able to access rapid tests. Those rapid tests are good, but they are uh, complementary to regular tests, PCR regular tests. So if kids uh, have some symptoms, we highly recommend parents to keep their kids at home. The measures designed to offer more layers of protection for students and their schools, especially as children under 12 remain ineligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. Children are less likely to become seriously ill from this virus, but some will. And in Alberta, where overall infection numbers are soaring, more kids are getting sick. The numbers are rising. It used to be we would only see maybe one or two children presenting for emergency department care every week. And now we're seeing a handful of them almost every day. With less support from the provincial government, Alberta school districts like the Calgary Board of Education are now doing things like contact tracing themselves. Though in a letter this week, parents were told that asymptomatic close contacts should keep coming to school. If you choose to keep your child at home, it will be marked as an unexcused absence. It's really been contradictory in these statements of what we are wanting people to do, what we are asking them to do, and then how we're enforcing these provisions. Creating confusion for parents in a dangerous time as the Delta variant continues to cause COVID-19 cases to rise. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Returning to the campaign trail, today Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole focused less on policy and more on personality. O'Toole took some personal jabs against Liberal leader Justin Trudeau. As Michael Couture reports, the attack strategy could be an indication that Tories believe their chance at forming government is slipping away. I have expectations of us running a positive campaign. In one breath, Aaron O'Toole said he wants to raise the bar of political discourse. Minutes earlier, the Conservative leader was focused on personal attacks, not policy. Every Canadian has met a Justin Trudeau in their lives. Privileged, entitled, and always looking out for number one. 
This level of mudslinging hasn't been seen in this election until now. That's how close the race really is with a week to go. But this liberal strategist believes it shows something else. I think it's a sign of desperation. It's a sign that at this point they are willing to do anything that they can to fight off Justin Trudeau, who they recognize is their main competition. Liberals, the NDP, and Conservatives are now vying for progressive voters. Monday, the Tories pitched a plan to improve maternity and parental leave programs, something last expanded by the Trudeau Liberals. And O'Toole plans to extend the Canada Child Benefit Aid even before the birth of a baby. Policies like the ones that are announced today certainly are designed to appeal to uh, women and young families. And I think that that is really a direct appeal from the part of the Conservatives to have a bit more of a softer image. Part of softening that image is O'Toole's declaration that he is pro-choice and an ally of the LGBTQ2 community. However, months ago, half of the Conservative caucus voted against a ban on conversion therapy, and a majority of his caucus voted in support of a bill that sought to restrict certain abortions, leaving some to wonder if hardline Tory backbenchers will really follow O'Toole's lead. He can't even get his party members to all vaccinate. Who is to trust that he can get them to vote the way that he, he thinks they should? That's the question the Liberals and NDP want people to be asking themselves as all parties make their pitch to progressive voters. Farah? Michael Couture in Ottawa. Thank you, Mike. Throughout the campaign, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has shied away from answering whether he would prop up a minority government. But this morning, he signaled he may be willing to join forces. I'll do whatever it takes to make sure I can form government. So if I'm in that position and I need to work with another party to form government to achieve the things that people need, We've listed out some of the things that we've mo noted that Mr. Trudeau broke his promises on that ended up costing people. I'm committing to that. It is a tight election race, and there's a good chance we might not even get a clear result on election night. But ahead of September 20th, Global National is working to get the full picture right across the country. We're on the home stretch of our big road trip across Canada. Tomorrow, Global National is broadcasting from Quebec City, and Donna Friesen joins us from there now. Hi, Donna. Hi there, Farah. Quebec has 78 ridings and it is coveted by all the political parties. And Quebec City, the riding here, has a fascinating history, electing a progressive conservative, a bloc, an NDP and a liberal MP. The margin of victory in that last election, less than 1%. There are lots of tight races here in Quebec, and now Quebec's premier has weighed in, saying he'd prefer a conservative minority. So we'll discuss the political dynamic here in Quebec, and I'll have an interview with Jody Wilson-Raybould about her new book, Indian in the Cabinet. That's tomorrow from Quebec City. Thank you, Donna. And from Quebec City, Global National is going to head to Brampton, Ontario, our final stop ahead of the federal election. And Donna will anchor our extensive coverage on election night right here on Global Television, as well as History, Global News Radio, and globalnews.ca. To a developing story in Nova Scotia, where police are investigating a terrible loss of life. A family of six, including four children between the ages of 3 and 11, were found dead last evening after a fire in a camper located in a rural part of the province. Ross Lord joins us now from Millville, Nova Scotia, near the scene of this tragedy. Ross. Farah, RCMP say the discovery was made early Sunday evening by someone who hadn't heard from the family in a while and came here to check on them. An RCMP spokesperson says a nine-meter camper in these remote woods near the Nova Scotia-New Brunswick border caught fire. Six members of the same family are dead, a man and a woman, and four children between the ages of three and 11. My understanding is it was a, a weekend trip that the family decided to take. Uh, the, the trailer itself is privately owned and it's on a private plot of land, so it's not like it was at a camp ground or a campsite or anything like that. RCMP say by the time their members arrived, the fire was out. They called the fire department to stand down. Investigators are restricting access, but they say the outside of the camper is intact. It, the belief is that it's not a suspicious fire, um, but again, we're, we're going to remain on scene and we're going to continue to hold that scene to ensure that if the fire marshal's office um, was to come back with a determination that the fire was suspicious, then we haven't released those scenes and we still have that evidence. The couple and their four children are reportedly from Amherst, Nova Scotia. The town, along with the local MLA, have organized a memorial at a nearby park for people to come and pay their respects. As the RCMP 
The fire marshal and the Nova Scotia Medical Examiner's Office continue to investigate. Farah? Ross Lord in Millville, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Ross. A disturbing trend at a Canadian university. Coming up, the multiple allegations of sexual violence on campus. Security is being ramped up in student residences at Ontario's Western University following troubling reports on social media of sexual violence. The university says there have been four complaints from students over the past week. Officials say they are taking action, including facilitating arrest and removing students from residence while investigations continue. The alleged cases do not appear to be connected to each other. Honestly, it's pretty scary. Like, I live right at the end of the street, and although I... I'm not in the residence. I can only imagine like what those girls and any other victims were going through. Counseling and gender-based support services are available to students to help ensure that they feel safe. Still ahead, North Korea back with more threats as the regime flexes its missile might. A fast-moving brush fire triggered evacuations and destroyed several homes in Mendocino County as it tore through the Northern California community Sunday evening. More than 13,000 personnel are fighting more than a dozen large active wildfires burning in the state. U.S. President Joe Biden approved a disaster declaration for California ahead of today's tour of the fire damage in the Sacramento area. The first commercial flight since the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan landed in Kabul today. The Pakistan International Airlines jet touched down in the Afghan capital with just a few passengers, but reportedly returned to Islamabad with about 70 people on board. They're believed to be mostly Afghans, including employees with international organizations and their families. After the withdrawal of U.S. troops on August 31st, the Taliban promised to allow Afghans to leave the country freely. North Korea says it successfully test-fired new long-range cruise missiles. According to state media, the missiles flew 1,500 kilometers before hitting their targets during the test over the weekend. Analysts believe this is possibly the country's first such weapon with a nuclear capability. Nuclear negotiations between the U.S. and North Korea stalled in 2019. Up next, I check in with Canada's young voters. What is it going to take to drive more of them to the polls? Every election, our youngest voters are consistently among the demographic with a lower turnout at the ballot box. But the world has changed dramatically since the last time Canadians went to the polls. And issues like affordability, equality and the climate have politically energized many young voters. I spoke with some students in Toronto about their interest in this election and what barriers they face. Welcome everyone to our election 2021 Toronto Center Candidates Debate. University student Hannah Nana Nana may be the debate moderator, but... I'm not eligible to vote. A refugee to Canada from war-torn Syria. She is not a citizen yet, but heads up XU Votes, a voter engagement campaign at Ryerson University. One of the simple uh, rights that people um, ask for was voting. Um, a lot of people lost their lives because of voting, and a lot of people lost their uh, friends and families' education, and they were forced to be displaced, like myself. So I uh, see the power and the energy that young people have. In 2015, young voters reversed a 40-year trend, flooding the polls with 57% voter turnout. That dipped slightly in 2019, but it's still a full 25% lower than those 65 to 74. And this year, there's no on-campus voting due to timing and COVID restrictions. Catherine Carson and Lena Mansour are starting a new year navigating packed schedules in a pandemic. Youth have a little bit of apathy at the moment, uh, and I think that they're unsure about who they want to vote for. And youth are trying to balance everything in their lives at the moment, as well as trying to keep up with the election. Despite that, they know what they do want in a government. We need affordability. Um, 
we're on a campus where a lot of people are really struggling to pay for their education. A lot of people have lost their jobs over the pandemic. And in order to build a future, we need to build a present. I wish that we were seeing more in regards to climate change, in regards to access for marginalized communities, whether it's reconciliation, affordability. I think this last couple of years has brought it home for all of us. I think the challenge will be to get people engaged and recognize that they can turn those concerns into political action through voting. And reaching young people is a challenge every election. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau and conservative leader Aaron O'Toole prefer photo ops, while NDP leader Jagmeet Singh is hoping for a youth uprising by being the only candidate on TikTok. Yeah. Who do you think is the most charismatic? Probably just Justin Trudeau, he's like a young guys that we can kind of like connect with rather than like the older other candidates I guess. He's actually the oldest one. Yeah, he's the funny. oldest. Yeah, the Justin Trudeau is the really? oldest one. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. Thing, actually because he's like on TikTok too and he does all those videos. Reaching young voters is one thing, but walking away with their vote is quite another. And that is Global National for this Monday night. I'm Farah Nasser. Thanks so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is the sunrise over Lang Lake near Espanola, Ontario. We love seeing your Canada, so please email us your pictures at viewers at globalnational.com. Be sure to tune in tomorrow when Donna Friesen broadcasts from Quebec City. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other.